Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. As we've been going together through this series that we call Proper Theology, as we have considered uh, various and sundry attributes of God, we have been careful all along the way to never lose sight of the simplicity of God. Uh, And we have at the same time uh, strived to not balance out competing attributes, which would be a denial of his simplicity, but at least to balance out our understanding and our presentation of those qualities. And we come to that uh, necessity again today, as we consider today, this truth about who God is. God is a God who rejoices. Now, I am a vigorous proponent and defender of the doctrine of the impassibility of God. And I want us to understand that so much of the emotional experiences that we have uh, are, in essence, reactionary, circumstantial. We feel the way we feel in large part because of things that have happened to us or near us. And nothing happens to God because he's God. He brings to pass his will all the time. And so one might be tempted to get this image of God in uh, understanding his impassibility and understanding that he is uh, transcendent over the vicissitudes of this life. One might get an image of God as a kind of stoic God, a kind of stiff upper lip God. He is immovable emotionally. Well, there's reason for that. He can't be carried away emotionally. But that's not the same thing as saying he has no emotions. And one of those emotions is his rejoicing, his delight. We've talked in this series, as well as in other segments along the way, uh, about the nature of the Trinity and their mutual joy and delight in one another, that even before the creation of the world, uh, each member of the Trinity was fully and absolutely, completely uh, content and satisfied and filled to the brim with joy in each other. And that's important to get. And it's important to realize that that we're not here to make up for some gap in God. We're not here because he needed us in order to do what he wanted to do or be what he wanted to be. That's all true. And none of it undoes the glorious biblical truth, that not only does he rejoice among the members of the Trinity, but there is a rejoicing in us. You, friend, if you are in Christ, you are a delight to your heavenly Father. You are a delight to your elder brother. You are a delight to the Holy Spirit that dwells in you and walks with you every day. I want you to think about that in light of your prayer life. I think so often we have this this infusion of guilt into uh, our prayer lives that, that goes something like this. We We feel like, well, we're supposed to pray. We don't necessarily have the uh, physical stamina to do so. Uh, We grow weary. We get distracted, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes us feel more guilty. And we 
think that God is in heaven getting angry with us and that if we uh, don't learn to be self-controlled and diligent, then he's going to stay angry with us. Well, it is absolutely true that your heavenly father very much wants you to pray. He very much wants me to pray. But it's not because he gets angry if I don't. It's because he loves me. He delights to have my attention, to have my conversation, to have me share with him what he already knows. Because it shows my zeal to share with him. Not because it gives him information he didn't have. But because it demonstrates my zeal to share with him. To be open with him. And I can do this again. Not just because he has coldly and aloofly and with great calculation merely forgiven me. But he's brought me into his family. He's made me his child. He loves me as a father loves a child perfectly, infinitely, unchangeably. And he rejoices, friends, when we rejoice over his rejoicing in us. It is part and parcel of his glory of his transcendent majesty that he delights in us. A couple of images I want to give you before we close to to help you grasp this reality. Uh, The first is the resurrection scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You remember that Susan and Lucy have been mourning the death of Aslan, uh, they come upon the empty uh, table where he had been uh, killed, uh, only to have him bound over the hill, uh, resurrected and filled with life, and roaring and romping and playing and carrying the girls. And, and, and he, he gives this great roar, Oh, children! That's how your father feels about you. He delights. He rejoices. The second is in my head. I, this is not, but I, I, if you've read uh, Tolkien, you remember Tom Bombadil. I have this image in my head. Every time it snows, I see the heaven, the Holy Spirit, walking through the clouds like Tom Bombadil, reaching into his side bag and just tossing fairy dust into the air that descends upon us as individual snow sculptures. The sheer fact that every flake of snow is its own unique design is just God being giddy about being God. doesn't take away from his majesty. It doesn't take away from his augustness. In fact, it's part of it. That's the God we worship. You may find it hard to believe, but today's hero you never heard of may very well have been the inventor of the podcast. It is, of course, always possible that you have heard of this hero. He is a published author. The book that he wrote, and I wish there were more, but the book that he wrote uh, was one of the most influential books I've ever read. It was a part of the Crossway uh, Turning Point Worldview series for which Marvin Olasky served as the series editor. The particular subject that he was called to tackle uh, was pop culture, and the book is called All God's Children and Blue Suede Shoes, The Christian and Pop Culture. The person I'm speaking of is Ken Myers. 
I read that book at the same time that I read Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which was a potent one-two punch uh, in waking me up to the ways in which I was allowing my thinking and my doing to be shaped by the broader popular culture. And that's why it was such a life-changing experience for me. But I also very much enjoyed uh, reading Ken's uh, delightful style of writing. There's a bit of snark and sarcasm, but gentle snark and gentle sarcasm uh, in his writing style. And I became a huge fan and uh, not long after that arranged to have Ken uh, write a monthly column for Table Talk magazine uh, dealing with issues of the broader culture. Uh, eventually, when the Renewing Your Mind radio program started, Ken was the original voice of the intros and the outros. And from time to time, I could sneak Ken into a speaking slot at conferences uh, and was delighted to be able to do so. But I remember one of those conferences, uh, Ken was walking around the bookstore with a briefcase and he would open it up and pull out some papers and hand it to people that he was talking to. Well, what he was doing was setting out to start what became Mars Hill Audio. And what Mars Hill Audio was, uh, it still exists, by the way, but when it started, it was... Uh, a kind of audio magazine that consisted principally of uh, Ken interviewing and commenting on uh, the thinking and the writing of uh, culture shapers. Uh, some or most of those may be professing Christians. Uh, typically, uh, at the sort of higher end of uh, the arts so that you, you might have an interview with Christopher Parkening, uh, the great classical guitarist who's a professing Christian. You might have an article with uh, Francis Collins, the, uh, the fellow who mapped the, the genome uh, or led the genome project, professing Christian. That kind of high-end, highbrow stuff uh, was who he would interview, and he, it still does, uh, and the style was very much driven by his experience with NPR, the NPR sound, NPR uh, professionalism, uh, and he produced these things, and this started back in the mid-90s. This started before the internet. Now when I look back, I think, yeah, that's a podcast. <laughs> that's exactly... He would send these out once a week, or, I mean, excuse me, once a month, and they would go out originally on audio cassette. And somewhere, in some box somewhere, I still have a bunch of those. Eventually they transferred over to CDs, and now I'm sure they're all downloadable. Get them. Listen to them. They're great. Subscribe to them. They're wonderful. But there's something else you need to know about Ken Myers. He's a gentle, gracious, kind man. The last time I was blessed to see Ken, I had invited him to come speak at a conference that I was putting on. And prior to that, it had probably been five or six years before I'd seen him. And he was just the same guy. I mean, it I just... He's the kind of fellow who you walk away from the conversation with him with two thoughts. One, I wish I could talk with that guy more because I really like him. And two, I wish I could talk to that fellow more because I really learn a lot from him. He's got insight. Ken is not the, the most dynamic speaker in the world, but he has a discernible fascinating perspective on the things that he talks about. Ken is the guy who takes the thing that you think you know and he gives it a quarter turn and gives you a new perspective to look at it and it blows your mind. That's why Ken Myers is a hero to me. 
Once again, let me encourage you to check out uh, his work at Mars Hill Audio. And uh, if you know Ken, or if you should communicate with Ken, or run into Ken, as is always the case, I would please ask that you would uh, let him know that he's still a hero to me. He knows he was. He was very patient uh, with me as a fawning acolyte uh, back in the day. But I'm still quietly and from a distance con- <laughs> holding on to that same posture with respect to Ken Myers. We come now in our ongoing series on the Westminster Shorter Catechism to question and answer number 36. The question asks, what are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? The answer is, the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Ghost, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. Now, We have been going systematically in order, just like it was written systematically in order, through these questions. And if you recall, uh, the last few times that we have covered the Shorter Catechism, we've looked at uh, the definitions of these three key terms, justification, adoption, and sanctification. And now the divines bring these three terms back together, but ask a specific question about what comes out of these specifically in the here and the now. It's almost as if the Westminster divines are using the language that we often use uh, when talking about eschatology, the language of the already and the not yet. We want to be careful to affirm at one and the same time uh, that there are blessings of the kingdom present now. We don't want to push the blessings of the kingdom so far into the future that we miss out on them now. On the other hand, we don't want to imminentize the eschaton, uh, which is a mouthful meaning having an over-realized eschatology, which is still a mouthful, which means acting as though everything that we're supposed to have is already here. It's not the case. It's not. But things are here. And the things that we have now are things worth rejoicing over and celebrating in. And that leads me to uh, uh, you know the small, uh, very, very small bone that I have to pick with the divine's on this question. I don't blame them. I understand the difficulty of their calling, and I'm certainly not claiming that I could have done any better. But I will tell you that there's something uh, less than joy-inducing to have these benefits listed out and described in this way. Uh, it, 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 it kind of, it's almost sterile the way these benefits are described. And if we were smart, if we were wise, we would take our time and we would seek to enter into them and let these benefits flourish and live and uh, fill our nostrils with their sweet scents uh, and our eyes with their delights. What do we get? What comes with? What accompanies our justification, adoption, and sanctification? What do you have already that you're not having to wait for? That starts off with the grandest one of all. We have the assurance of God's love. You have that now. 
not the assurance that you will have his love when the not yet becomes already, when the eschaton is imminentized. You have it now. The fullness of the love of the Father. So desperate. So desperately, I want my fellow brothers and sisters and me to get from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes this glorious truth that the love that the Father has for me is not something that increases and grows as I grow in sanctification, nor something that increases and grows when I come to my glorification. He loves me intimately, infinitely, personally, by name, right now. Imagine what your days would be like if you started out each day rehearsing that glorious truth. If each time something unpleasant happened to you, you turned your attention back to that glorious truth. But that's not all. There's more. There's peace of conscience. Not only does your father love you, he's not mad at you. He's removed your sins from you. The past ones, the present ones, and the future ones. They are as far from you as the east is from the west. Your conscience is at peace. Because you have confessed. And because all that you confess has been covered. We have been given joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is inside me. Again, how might my life change if I simply meditated on that truth for just a few minutes every morning when I woke up and every night before I fell asleep? I'm not alone. I'm not alone. God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. What would happen if every time I'm facing one of those fork in the road temptations, if I remembered, God is with me. God is with me. When I affirm the infinitude of God's love for us, it is my habit to always remember to say, to, to, to mention its immutability. It can't be lost. And that's where our fathers in the faith finish their answer. Perseverance there into the end. You don't get the gift. Please read this carefully. You don't get the gift if you persevere. You get the gift which includes the perseverance. It is not that all who persevere are saints. It is instead that all saints persevere. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsportjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.